Kayok sa tini, takat yohan. Kung siyis hati ati, kung siyis wujin ka sa tii, wasa aktu yek kayok ana. Wujin ay aling gitu tultu yag. Yawa hati wasa guk na kaya wto sa kuha ay katangi, kaya wto sa guk. Yawa yek kwati. Just yej na ne. Tlaki ki awa ha yuk atang ki da. Ya ya ki awa adat yuk agak tutla a da da ti nek sa ha ya ti. Gwa tla tu wa sa gu lingit ghe nak yuk atla atki kha sa ti. Ye ka gwa ti. Jis ju o ya kal ti ghe nak aya gwa ne gak tu aad. Ye awa ha tu wa ti. Gwa ni chish. Uh, thanks. Thanks for coming. Thanks for being together. We're going to be together studying Klingit, and I'm happy about that. Uh, we really want to know the Klingit language, and we want to know how to use it. And those are kind of, you know, I always think about this stuff, like the comprehension and the speaking. Like, how can I just get to understand what people are saying? And then how can I get to a point where I can say what I want without having to look it up in a hundred different books first? And so these are the things that I think about. And I think if you just work every day on the language, you just keep working, keep working, you're going to become a speaker. So we're going to do some things through this semester to sort of uh, talk to each other, Get to know each other a little bit. Some of us are online, some of us are here in the class. And and hopefully, like we really start to feel like a single thing, like a like a team. So we're gonna look at some things throughout this whole semester. Sometimes like here's some lists of things and memorize them. And here's some of these things. Let's talk about how they function. And then we're gonna balance like sort of like the language of use. So, you know, what are things that we need to know how to say? To just use the language on a daily basis. And then, what do we need to sort of understand how the language functions so we could fully construct this whole grammar in our mind? Which is fun. I, I like to do that stuff. Uh, but we're going to kind of do a little bit of everything and I thought a fun way to warm up would be looking at this uh, text. Let me share it with the Zoom gang. And let me try and too many windows. OK, there we go. So it's called Little Readings in Clinkit. Let me rearrange my screen here. I don't remember which direction goes which way. So I'll pull some things over here and hide myself. Uh, so this is an older text uh, from the 1980s, I believe, written by Vesta Dominix, illustrated by J. Leslie Boffa. And I went through and I updated some of the text because we, we write Tlingit just a little bit different these days than we did in those days. Uh, I didn't change the language in there. And what I'd like us to do to sort of do a bit of a warm-up activity. Let's see, by my count, wait, let me I get used to using these two screens. We got eight of us online, which I think would include our camera, so that'd be seven. And then Kainach, Dachnach, Naskinach, Dachroninach, Kejinach. And Kejinach in the room. So we should have about 12 people all together. Uh, oh, uh, so we have uh, 13. So I'd like everybody to take a turn and read the sentence. I just want to listen to how you uh, speak Klingit. If there's anything you have a hard time with, don't worry about it. Just power through. The one thing I'd suggest when we're reading Tlingit in this class, 
try not to bring your English tones into it. So like you see this word and you're not sure how to say this word. Like don't do that thing in English. Like we do it all the time, all kinds of stuff, right? What's that? Squirrel? Right. And so that's saying I'm guessing. I think it's a squirrel. But you're just going to have to look at the tone, look at the vowel length, be true to the language. Then we're going to translate. And some of you folks might have seen some of these before. So you might have, uh, if you've seen them and you know the answers because we've gone over them before, then maybe just pause now on that. Or if you're just nailing every single one, you're like translating every single one, maybe just hold back and let someone else give it a try. But then if it's quiet, go ahead and chime back in. Ask questions about these as well, because uh, I will, we can break from this. I'll show you how to look up all the words that we're looking at. And uh, it's a good sort of reading and translation exercise to get us started. After we do this, then we're going to go through this sort of history of Tlingit, just in case um, you folks may not have heard some of that stuff before. I'm sure most of you have. And then we're going to go through uh, and just start looking at the beginning Tlingit workbook, walking through the second edition. It's about halfway done. It's taken forever to finish it, and I'll tell you some of the reasons why. Okay. Any questions or thoughts before we get started? Uh, basically, what we do here is in the evening, I will have the downloaded recording of the Zoom class. I'll put it onto YouTube. If you go to clinkitlanguage.com under Learning Clinkit, Intermediate Clinkit, that will be our class webpage. So if you end up, uh, you couldn't make it to class, you can watch it on that page. It'll have the link right to YouTube. And it will also have all of the handouts that we use. So there'll be a PDF version of this text, the little readings in Clinkit, uh, and you can just download it. Try not to read ahead too, too far, I guess. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have told you. Uh, but just maybe wait until we read the whole thing through, because it has the English in there. So don't look at all the answers and then come in here and be like, oh, man, I know all these. So let's go through. So this was uh, originally made in 1981, the National Bilingual Materials Development Center, University of Alaska. Uh, and it was updated in 2019 with funding from Goldblatt Heritage Foundation. Who would like to read first? Do kick away hint would the git. Okay. So uh, now I'll say it and everybody just repeat after me. Das away a shoe. Das away a shoe. Kick away hint would the git. Kick away hint would the git. And if you're from Teslin, you would probably say a show. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you why. Any kind of a U vowel, so whether it's short and low, short and high, long and low, long and high, on either side of that, if you have a character with an underline, it'll probably go from U to O. That's the magic. And then, but there's other ones that just sort of do that, like Hado. I don't know why that one doesn't. It just does. It's magic. Okay. Who could translate the first sentence? I don't know Ashok, but that's a word. Be is that Ashok over there? Well, that's a way. And we're gonna look at this. Uh, how to put questions together. Once you get dasa, what type of question is that asking? So what question? It's a what question. So what are they verbing, right? So there's there's a verb there too. Uh, laughing. Laughing. 
right? And this one, we're going to talk throughout the semester about whether there's an object there, whether there's a subject there. The subject does it, happens to the object. But what does that mean? What does that mean? In this case, for the subject to laugh at the object. That's important to know, okay? Because sometimes you have, like, what is the object thing? What's, what is being verbed? And in this case, there's an object there. So you could say, kachuk. They're laughing at me. Right? Can I guess the second one? Oh, wait, we got to put this whole thing together now. That's the way a shuk. Just what are they laughing at? What are they laughing at? What are they laughing at, right? And, yeah, go for the... Yes. The younger sibling fell in the water. So there's a couple things here. Like, so, sibling terms are gendered. We always have to remember that. There's a bunch of non-gendered stuff in Klingit. Hu and du, and sometimes even ka is non-gendered. However, when you say kik, that is a male's younger brother or a female's younger sister. However they identify, but it just has to do with being the same gender on the kinship tree and also same clan. So if your clan was Kaguantan, all and if you're let's say you're female, Kaguantan. All those people who are the same generation as you about, who are younger, that's your keek. All of them. That's what you should be calling them, as far as the way that kinship works. Okay. And then we have Heen, which is water, the letter T is to arrive at, and would get is for something to fall. Okay? Thoughts or questions? Heen to arrive at? The T, that T is. Heen to arrive at. So to arrive at the water. Yeah. To arrive at the water, fall in. Yeah, because you could say hin de wudzigit, they fell towards the water. And now we're talking about hitting the water. De is towards. And we're going to get to these too. Like if it's all, be like, what? Day two? What are we doing? It's all right. We're just reading some stuff, talking about it. And we'll start the build up after this. What is she laughing? And we, gotta, we, we end up doing some guessing. Long hair, you know, my son's got long hair. People call him girl all the time. I don't know. But we're just sort of guess. There's no gender except for the keek is a gendered term. This means same gender, younger sibling. Okay. Who wants to read the next one? Isik akwe katapa a dudushikat ujikik. Sheesh. One line at a time, everybody repeat after me. Isik akwe katapa. Isik akwe katapa. A. A. Dudushikat ujikik. Hey, yuck, hey. So let's take an, maybe I'll put this. I go back and forth on a couple things. I waffle on some things. One is, should there be a period there? I don't know. Sometimes I do it, sometimes I don't. Ah. Why should there be a period? So if I say akwe, I hear a little pause there. I don't say akwe. Or else it sounds like akwe. I hear akwe. So, but if you say akya, I don't hear as much of a pause there. And if I say akyu, I don't hear much of a pause there. 
for Akwe, I hear a pause there. And I have someone who is like, I will die on the hill. There must be a pause. And so I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll put it in there. So, all right. What do you guys think we're looking at here? And even we're just grabbing little pieces. Totally fine. Um, younger sister? The younger sister? That would be Keek. Keek would be the younger sister. Oh, daughter. Daughter. Yeah. And then the I right before it. Your daughter. Your daughter, your daughter. Then we got this Akwe business. Is that, is that, mm. is that your daughter crying? Right. right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Akwe, and we'll look at what this is. This is three little things smooshed together. A, uh, ge, and we. Those three things smooshed together, uh, just says, we'll put focus on this thing. It doesn't have a whole lot of meaning. Uh, you ever see somebody get a thing get name? Oh. Uh, they put money on there and then they'll say, uh, uh, that uh at the very end is the same uh that you hear right here. It just puts, and you could, you could use it in speech too. Go to cheese, uh, you could do that. Awe really is like that is. Akwe is a ge we. Is that? So if I see something, kanat akwe, is that a squirrel? Kuhida akwe, is that a pencil? The ge turns something. So like remember we talked about this rising tone thing. Don't do that in Tlingit. That's not how you ask questions. You either use a question particle, dasa, wasa, guksa, adusa, or ge. Ge makes the whole thing a yes or no type of question. Where it goes, it goes immediately after what you're asking about. So if I was going to say, is your daughter crying? I would just move it over to the end. And it would turn into age as opposed to akwe. But the ge moves to the end to say, are they verbing? But that's not what this is asking. We're sitting there and we see somebody crying. And we're saying, is that your daughter who is crying? Okay? That's why I like this little book, because it gives you these little things and shows you. I was always, whenever, when I was learning Klinga, I just put ge at the end of the sentence. I was like, something, 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 ge. And then so they'd be like, ah. you know, and you'll you'll see where sometimes there's different spots you could go. But the other thing, I was at a place and these kids were using Klingit. I was so happy they were using Klingit. But they're walking around there saying, Hine I was like, you're not asking me a question. So I said, Hin ge ituasaku. Or you could say, Hin ituagesaku. Either one. Either one's fine. So sometimes it could kind of move around. I don't know what ah uh, is, right? There are different ways to say it. I hear people say ah. Uh, and uh, Evelyn Hotch used to say, there's no tone in it. Don't you put any tone in it. So I, okay, so I try not to. But some people do. They go ah. Uh, ah. Uh. I, I, I don't think it really matters. But I don't know if people have studied the ah uh, in depth. People will know what you're saying. Do she put with your feet? The cat something. The cat ran, ran away. Her cat, her cat ran away or her cat got lost. Mm. It could be either one. In this case, we'd probably assume that it ran away. You could, this could also, there are some other stories. Raven and the Fog Woman. So he's being not nice to his wife. And they'd say, She ran away from him. So, there's a couple things going on in here. Du is a single there, mm -hmm. that person's. It's not gendered. Douche is a cat. Mm -hmm. 
The little I at the end means it belongs to someone or there's a relationship there. Achdushi, my cat. And we're gonna learn how to put that thing on there. That's one of the things we learn in intermediate thing It's how to guess what that suffix will be. It's usually gonna be an I, sometimes it'll be a U, sometimes it'll be a YI, sometimes it'll be a WU. When things move, Huneg, ah, can I just ask when when it is a possessive I like douche? Is it e? Is it an e sound more than an if? When that with that single I. Probably. Okay. A vowel suffix on the end can be long or short. It doesn't matter. You could say douche, and you can say douchey. It doesn't matter. It doesn't affect the meaning. The convention is we write it short, but most people probably say it long. But it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's kind of a, there's a few of these standing rules, like we call it open. An open suffix, which means it ends with a vowel. You can write it long or short. Just like day, a day, a day I'm gonna go towards it. You could write that D high toned E or D high toned E I. It doesn't affect the meaning. Some people, really like, yeah, some people really like to get that. I write it exactly how I hear it. That's fine. That's fine. And then others, they just sort of go, well, this is the standard. This is what everybody does. I think what throws me off is that when you get into certain like nouns of certain things that you possess, it throws like a yeh in there at the end or like different things to be the possessive, but still including the I. Yeah. So pretty soon, and you know, the way I like to teach too is I like I got this set of things. It's like we gotta learn all these things. But if you guys say, hey, let's learn that thing, we'll go learn that thing. Like you wanna do that right now, we'll learn how to do that right now. Or we can just wait a little bit. It's up to you guys. Because we're gonna walk through beginning clinket too, because maybe some of us uh, have only been studying clinket for a year, and so I don't need to go super crazy into all the rules. And maybe some of us haven't studied clinket in a while come in here and be like, okay, here's all the, here's this page of 20 rules about this suffix. But we're gonna get to this stuff. Um, why is it a i? Why is it a ye? Well, that one's a oh. What's going on here? There's a set of rules though. It's really, and it's fun. It's really fun to see because it kind of unlocks it. And then we'll look at, every language does this kind of stuff. It just, it has this way of doing things. And for people who grow up speaking it, when they hear it, they'll be like, oh, no, that sounds off. And then they'll correct you. But it's not like they'll say, oh, that's a, the voice thing. And, you know, unless they're like, they study linguistics or something. Okay. So most, so this is what we call a motion verb for something to move. And in this case, it's to run. Usually there's some sort of direction right in front of it to run towards this thing, to run away from this thing, to run through this thing. This one is put. Put on its own means lost. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's a number of different ways that this is used. Like you could say, uh, they, they walked, they went for a hike and they got lost. It, it does happen. Put will good. It could also mean, in this case, the reason why you'd say ran away is because the cat's supposed to be home. Maybe the cat didn't get, maybe the cat's like, get me out of here, pull my hair, make me wear these crazy outfits. Want to go kill birds, let me out. And so maybe the cat was like, I'm not put with your feet. I'm a duck with your feet. I'm out of there, right? But the put usually means lost. And we're going to look at that. There's some parts in here that we're going to look at this semester. It's very interesting. And when we when we learn Tlingit in here, sometimes we're looking at these the cultural part of it. Like this is a big cultural concept. And then other times we're looking at we're going to pull this thing apart and see how it works. And I know sometimes for some birth speakers it gets a little uncomfortable for them when we do that because they'll say that's not what that means. I was like I know that. 
but just I'm trying to show folks like this thing to see and to think about. Because there's this thing on here that you're going to start seeing all over the place. But don't worry about it for now. Okay. You guys want to do one more or you want to do something else? Like this. Yeah. Like this. yeah. I think it's a good fun start. And so Kadakah is a third person to be crying. And it's it's a a couple of different ways that you could think of this one. Because you could say, Isik awekah. That's saying the same thing. Is that your daughter crying? But then she's over there kind of silent tear type of cry. This is ah, this is the big cry. There's a loud cry. That's, and that's and so this this little ka is just sort of changing the meaning a little bit and we're going to talk about all this like what do all these little pieces do why doesn't we put this piece on why doesn't we put that piece on there sometimes it's predictable sometimes it's not entirely predictable if I was going to use the last sentence to kind of construct simple ones could I say ah uh, like I ran you would put it right here you'd say khujihi yeah. So the, the ach is like my thing, or I have a relationship to it. And, but for me to do it, we're going to get into the subject pronoun, which is going to be in between this thing and that thing. And you're going to reach a point, too, where you, when you look at a verb, you'll be able to see. Um, here, we'll just I'll grab this. I don't mean to derail this, I'm just trying to like no, such thing. see how I can take apart sentences to make other ones. So here's this put wujahik. One of the things that we start to do uh, in intermediate and advanced Lingit is we start to say, well, what's in there? When I look at this, I see put, so there's k, and that little t. That's the same T for hint with to get to arrive at a place, to be at a place, either touching it, arriving at, sometimes moving around. The next thing that I see, oops, is this, and this, and this, and this. These are the parts to that verb. When you pull on, it's like, uh, well, I got a little thing here that's supposed to plug in, and then I can plug all kinds of things into my computer. Then it, <laughs> it fell apart. So and I was like, okay, I'm just putting that away because I don't want to mess with that. But sometimes that's what we're going to do with Klinget, is we're going to just pull it apart a little bit. And then I could tell you exactly what these little parts do. And uh, this one, so this one means it has something to do with a given space. It's really hard to sort of put it into one English word. And we'll look at that one later. Just remember, qh is very interesting. The same one you have in qwati for the weather to be a certain way. Uh, okay. Start seeing it all over the place. Is that the same qh in kudziti? Uh, it's the same one in kudziti, right? Kusiat. Yeah. Kusiat. To be smart, right? You all are intelligent seeing this all over the place. Is it a physical space? Yes. Is it always a physical space? Right. I, I actually think it's conceptual. Okay. But conceptually, it's a physical space? Or is that too much to say? We call it aerial. Um, I would say usually it's a physical space. But sometimes, like to say yakudzige is to be intelligent. I don't know what the kuh is doing there. What is that? Same akudzati, like I exist in a space. Okay. So what the y does here, there are certain things that pop up in a very specific part of the verb. And that says, okay. We're going to start moving this verb around in terms of how we're talking about. Is it happening? 
did it happen? Is it going to happen? Those types of things all take place in this one little spot in the verb. And in this case, this one, which is very often w, means let's talk about this verb strictly in terms of whether or not it has happened. Doesn't mean past tense. It just means let's talk about it whether or not it has happened. And it'll, it'll eventually, it'll make sense. The Tlingit works different than English. English has a lot to do with time. When? Now? Then? Tlingit's just like, yeah, it doesn't really matter. What matters is whether or not it happened. Kunek? Ah. I'm sorry. Did somebody else have a question? I don't think so. Okay. So is that you, you, I was beginning to think, oh, when it becomes a woof, that it's, it happened because it was, she fell or, or she's now going back to, she fell in the water like it happened. Is that why it's a woof? Yes. And then, would, would you he means ran away that it happened so is that what the w becomes there's a bit of a formula here the y on its own plus if there's an i in the classifier those two things means we're talking about it happening okay so they they serve their different functions right so the w says did it happen or not? Let's just let's just figure that out. Yes or no? Did it happen? And some of these, it's a present tense thing, but we're still putting that, you know, like a, a lot of us know how to say, yuck a ilchsetini. That little W in there is this thing. W plus I, there's ilchsetin. That means I have seen you. It has it has happened, even if it's right now. Because it has to have happened in order to say it happened. And that's just playing it works a little different sometimes. Good questions. Okay. So this zero thing, sometimes we write a zero. We're not going to write it if we're going to just write what the thing it is. But if we want to pull those parts out, this is another thing that thing it does that English doesn't do. Whenever you switch to a third person, a singular they, doing something, there's never a pronoun there. And that, I think, takes a little bit of getting used to. So we say, I, I did it, you did it, did it. Just did it. There's no pronoun there, which is why. Anytime you're talking about some third person, some other person, talking to you about this other person, they did it, there's never a pronoun there for what they did, which is why. The J is the classifier. We're going to talk about that thing. It does all kinds of cool stuff for us. Tlingit is not the only language that Navajo has a classifier. Denaina has, a, has the classifier. Koyakon has the classifier. It marks a couple things. One is saying, like, we're changing what we're talking about. Like, so instead of carrying something, you're carrying a, a box with something in it. So sometimes the classifier will switch. You're dragging it or you're dragging it by the handle. So sometimes it's saying, let's put it in a category. Other times, like you could say, yuck a, it's good. Yitlik a, you made it better. So sometimes it's saying not just happening, someone made it happen. And then the other thing the classifier likes to do is just say, Let's mark this as happened. Okay. And then he is to run. So yeah, that, that's how I would sort of, when I do this kind of work, I, I, I break it apart. And that's, I've been doing this stuff in the, in the beginning Clink It workbook. And there's groups of us that kind of have these little debates about how we should be doing this. And, you know, and it all comes back to like, for some, they're saying like, I want it to line up with linguistics and that's what this thing is called and that's what it is but then sometimes I'm like well it's too complicated we gotta it's gotta be a learning tool 
Okay, we'll do one more. Then we'll take a break. Yeah. We'll come back, we'll do something else. But we'll, we got the whole next couple weeks to go through this. We'll just do three or four pages uh, every evening and just translate it and look at those. There's some neat things in here too. Who wants to read this? Anybody? I'll do this one. And Ulug Asweet says, We do to our Ushku. Shall do Sheshik. Sheesh. Okay, first sentence. Aunt Uwanuk Achyit. Aunt Uwanuk Achyit. And we'll break this one into two parts, like where you see the line break. Keshawe du tuwa ushku. Shau du khashi. Hey. What do we got here? Is something related to like I'm hungry or you know. my son? My son, yeah. Yan, uh, ach eat, yan uwaha. That's right. But um, ach eat, my son. Aunt uanuk is something about being angry. I think I've heard in a crow story before. Yes, aunt uanuk ach eat, my son is angry. So there's something. Uh, in Hawaiian, they call it he'e. We call it na the octopus. That's how they talk about Hawaiian grammar. They say, like, there's these na these octopus tentacles, and they're parts of a sentence and they can move around. Shingit is like that as well. Aunt uanuk, those two pieces got to stay together. Ach yeet, those two pieces got to stay together. Which one comes first just depends on what's the most important piece of information. He's angry, my son. My son is angry. So English kind of does the same thing too, right? No, maybe not as much, but I think it does. You could say, Achit Khant Uwanuk. The most important thing is that it's your son. Khant Uwanuk Achit. The most important thing is he's angry. Whew, you know, and it's a lot of it might depend on what's kind of like, are you answering a question? Like if someone says, who's angry, you would start with Achit. And you might even, you might not even say is angry because that was the question. But it sounds like, who's that over there all angry? You know, Achit. And like, what's going on with your son? Can't do a look, right? Can you say it the same way that it comes from you can drop the chroma, so not notice it's the chroma, but would it still be a sentence if you just said, Yeah, they are angry. Yep, they are angry. So the achyit just tells you who's angry. And then we'll, we'll learn how to say, you're angry, I'm angry, we're angry. Them plurals are angry. People are angry. What about this next part? Um, hair, uh, his haircut doesn't want uh, cutting it, cutting his hair. Yeah. So uh, this you can. It's interesting too because. The interpretation could be, he doesn't want his hair cut. He didn't want his hair to be cut, right? I could interpret it both ways from that same sentence. So kind of like, if I heard that, I'd probably look at him like, oh, he got the hair cut, right? So. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I was seeing that too with a uh, set of two woot or school. Uh-huh. Uh, seeing it to uh, I instead of I want as versus uh, I feel. Yeah, he, did, he didn't want. So uh, there's a couple of points to be made here. One, you gotta remember there's two wu and two wa. 
to w, to wa. They are similar but different things. So if I say ach to w, siku. Let's do this thing again. Let me make a new page. So, oops. So, oops. <laughs> Let me say one thing and do the other. So, ach tu wu siku. I am happy. I'm happy. That's all I'm talking about. I'm just happy. I feel happiness. At the center of it is this concept of tu wu. That can be interpreted into a few different things, depends on the context. The first thing I think of with tu wu would probably be feelings. But it's also thoughts, intentions, desires, and roughly this living, thoughtful spirit of a human being. Tu wu. And a lot of times you'll say, ah, tu wu, and then some sort of verb that has to do with emotion. In this case, segu is happiness. So my feelings are happy. A slight but important change would be tu wa. Tu wu, tu wa. Tu wu, tu wa. Gotta keep them, you know, a little bit, just keep them, which one's which. They're very similar. This one, ah tu wa segu, is I want it or I like it. And I think in classical Shingit, you didn't say I love, like I love fish, I love ice cream, I love baseball, right? Like stuff like that. You didn't use the love for you just use this. I like it. The tuwasaku could also mean you desire it. Like you could say to someone, ah tuwak isaku. And then it's but the situation's gotta be right for that. That's like, I want you. I just just so we're clear, as long as everybody's okay with everything. Um tuwak isaku. So sometimes this will pop up, but only if the next thing, usually if the next thing has a vowel. The next thing has a what? The next thing has a vowel, like this. That's saying I want, but again, context is everything, right? Because I could, I could use this to say I want you to study thing. So I got to add that next thing. If I don't add that next thing, then, right? And we got it, the Title IX case and all the other serious stuff, and we don't want that. Um, but also, just sort of conceptually as well. Like, uh, in English, we say all kinds of stuff. Hey, I, I like your jacket. You know, I like your vest. That's cool. But in thing you say, I, I want it. You know, that, that's kind of how you would, but there's other ways to go around it. Say, your vest is nice. Your vest is good. Right? You can say stuff like that. So sometimes we just got to switch up the way we think about things and then say them. But we're going to get the isigu off of it. To wu, to wa. To wu, to wa. So, but they're very similar as well. So just, you know, as you're going forward and start talking about feelings and stuff, just remember that to wu is more with feelings, to wa is more with wanting, liking, desiring. And when we put clash in front of a verb, that verb has to change. You can't just say yak e, clash yak e. Ach tu wasagu, clash ach tu wasagu. That verb actually has to change. And we'll take a look at that um, a little later. But just remember, for now, just look up the negative version of it, or just remember. So in this case, you'd say, um, 
Oops. Es acht to what was go. I do not want it. I don't want it, or I don't like it. Pickles, the way es acht to what was go. Whatever the thing is, right? Yeah, you can you can have if you, we got pickles, you can have mine. I don't want them. Um, but that's yeah. So that and that also means like I don't like it, right? So because of that, when we go back to this, context is everything. So I like to say interpret. I'll say translate quite often, but I like to say interpret more than translate because there's different ways. You could say, he didn't, he doesn't like his haircut, which means he got a haircut and he doesn't like how it turned out. That could, I could interpret it that way as well. Or, he never wants to get, there's other ways you could say that too. He never wants anybody to cut his hair. Maybe it could be one of those types of things. But we, all we know is, look at him, he's grumpy. All we know is he's mad. Ah. Uh, to be happy, to feel like, to want to do, to want to desire, is that the negative of both of them? Okay. We're going to take a look at something real quick, and then we'll take a break. And then we'll go, we'll do something different. Okay. Where is it? Here it is. So cool. I've never really had the opportunity to like break things down linguistically. Uh huh. Yeah. So this is like. Really yeah, and we're gonna we're gonna walk through like all these parts, and then you just you start to identify them, and then you you start to look at stuff, and then you get to this point where. You don't have to memorize it anymore. Like you can really strongly predict what it's going to be. Um. I'll give you guys a little context uh, to this one. I was working with Kahwan Ish, George Davis, every single week. I go to his house every Friday, work with him. He was just amazing, An incredible speaker, fun, funny. He would tell you anything that you wanted to know. Like there's all kinds of we had some questions, but all kinds of stuff. And there's some elders who were maybe a little bit shy about telling us all some of the hardcore furs, you know. But for me, I was like, well, it's a whole language. We people say and do all kinds of stuff in languages. So we did uh, we did this exercise, and we're gonna take a look at this exercise probably later in this, maybe even next semester. But we're gonna take a verb, like sechan, which is to love, and we're gonna say, I love you, I love you all, I love them. I love plural them. I love people. You love me. And just do every single combination that's possible. So I, I just kind of mapped it out and I sat down with Kahwan Ish and I said it in English and he would say it in Tlingit. We did all the, we loved everybody. Everybody loved everybody in every single combination. But then I was like, well, I got to get the negatives. So I said, I don't love you. <laughs> His wife was, she's always in the next room watching TV, but she always listened to what we're doing. Because then I heard her, she goes, Yishan! <laughs> so, but then we, we did all of them, like, I don't love you, I don't love you all, I don't love them, I don't love the plural them, I don't love people. And then he gave me this one, which is, Hesh dasa uchsechan. Who's, who's got a good prediction on what that one is? So, what? Dasa is what, but if I put tlesh or hesh in front of dasa, it changes. Negative, right? Yeah, so that's negative, right? So hesh is usually not. Mm -hmm. So not what? what? Love. Sachan is love. I don't know the ugh. So the uchsechan is the negative, it's saying, I don't love it, whatever it is. I don't love anything. I don't love anything. <laughs> then I, I went and got a picture of Oscar the Grouch. Like, yes, this is it. It's my moment. Um, so we were doing all these things, and then he just laughed, and he, he gave me that, which is, I don't love anything. Um, 
But what I wanted to look at here, uh, and we'll look at this thing later, but usually when a verb switches negative, there's a couple things that pop up. This uh sound pops up, the letter U, and that usually marks like specifically did not happen. If we're saying it didn't happen, not going to happen, hasn't happened yet, this little U pops up. It looks very similar to that YU thing, but it's, it's different. The other thing is the classifier needs to be in a certain way, which is back to its natural form. So we go from ya to zero. We go from uh, z to the letter s. We go from kl to um, actually kl. And, and we'll look at that stuff. So usually the classifier just switches from one form to another. But there's a few of these verbs, like yak a is good. Klesh uk eh is not good. Klesh ushk eh is actually the opposite. That's not just the negative of that verb. It's saying, this is bad. This is, and so there's a handful of these that Ktu uh, Dukan is a linguist from Massachusetts who uh, used to come up here every summer and do a bunch of awesome work. So he'd get these elders together and he'd think of these things to get them to and it would reveal a bunch of stuff like um, we knew that this was the case, but we couldn't, at least I couldn't figure out why was there yak e, klesh uk e, klesh ushk e. I was like, why was that? And so for a few of these verbs, there is an opposite. So you can have fun, not fun, and boring, right? So the, but those are different things. It's probably break time. Then we're going to slow it down look at something else, and do a bit more of a, a walk through the beginning Klingit workbook. So, uh, uh, who started this? Okay. <laughs> it's a positive and a negative, and a negative phantom phantom. Um, Oops. Is it like they're on a continuum, equally spaced, or, I mean, there's some things you can say, I'm interested, I'm disinterested, I'm uninterested, but really interested and uninterested are the extremes, and disinterested is neutral in the middle. But it doesn't look like any of the ones in the middle here, Trek, okay, Trek, yeah, it doesn't look from the way they are laid out as if they're really in the middle. They're sort of on the negative side. Right. But then there's an extreme negative. Yes. Well, these are the only ones we know of that do this. And there could be others. For most of the verbs, you just say is, isn't. And then you can say really is, kind of isn't, really isn't. So usually you would use an adverb to just start to really kind of say, I kind of don't want it. So you could say stuff like that. You say, I, I kind of really don't like that. But then you could say, I really don't want pickles, right? Or raisins. There's another one. My kids put raisins in my lunchbox there just to laugh at me. Because you know I'd look and be like, put raisins. Um, so yeah, so these are the only ones that, that we know of that have this is, isn't, is actually the opposite. So like uh is like that could also mean evil in a lot of ways. Um, and if we look at this, you can have smart, not smart, and dumb, right? Like the, the case that you would use this is someone did something and, and people were really upset, like, you know, you said, don't do this, you're going to get hurt. And then they did that thing and they got hurt and people were just really upset. And they might say it was, re it was reckless, it was just they knew they weren't supposed to do that thing. Or you could be being... Pretty harsh with folks, so it does happen. Oh, sorry, I didn't have the chat open. Let's see. Oh, <laughs> the music teacher and me. Yes, I love trash. Anything dirty or dungy or dirty. <laughs> Just sneak <click> away. <laughs> sneak away. <laughs> Testa sa tsu. 
There, you can say that. I only love trash. I don't love anything else. Okay, why don't we, uh, I don't know, take a 10 minute break, get a little snack if you need it, get a little air, take a little walk, some water, tea, coffee, whatever your thing is. We'll be back in 10 minutes and we'll do something a little bit different.
Yeah, I do um, a few thoughts I work, so I do a lot of his explanations to be verbatim. Okay, just so you can hear it. Yeah, that helps me. I got that. I'm, not, I'm good at memory, remembering it. So in yeah. short notes, that just doesn't work for me. Yeah. yeah. I'm just, I just like fast. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Okay. And I don't watch the time. I just start shaking to it, mm -hmm. too. And, um, that was nice to be able to go back and I guess something and, mm -hmm. and type it out and then I just have notes for over and over. Okay. So that might be useful if you like. Yeah. If you're not as fast or like if you just missed something because you're thinking about something. Mm -hmm. You can come back and look at the recording I guess. Uh -huh. I don't know if I'll do that for Yeah. Yeah, I do take all of my notes like under one document and just like hold it by weeks. So Usually I do. This is I have my just have word on this one. <coughs> but I have a I have a word document like on my work computer that mm -hmm. I like to just email to myself and have it. Oh, one document. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I like to be able to just click there. Okay. I was just wondering. Okay. So uh, I wanted to share a little clip. Basically, it was just audio. Uh, I can't remember what we were working on. Something for some reason skulls came up. So I used to work a lot with. Kaohuan Ish, George Davis, and Shekshani, March Detson. I'll show you folks pictures of them and stuff. They were just wonderful, wonderful elders. They're both in their 90s when I was working with them five years ago. Uh, but just so some sort of fun, like, category. Like, Tlingit always has these categories. So every now and then you'll run into things where there's multiple words for things depending on what state they're in. So I thought I'd share an example, and then we'll look at the beginning Tlingit workbook. An empty skull would be the shakahago. It the Empty skull. Oh. Shakahago. No brains in it. But right, but with your all your brains and everything, it's shakanuko. <laughs> <laughs> when your brains are all in there. <laughs> so that's pretty fun. Um, so shakahaku would be like uh, a similar verb would exist for like an empty clamshell. Like so, there's nothing in there. And then shaka nuchu is, uh, nuch is like a shell, like an eggshell or the shell itself. But then there's, you got brains in there. So I can't remember what the context was, but I thought that was pretty fun. And um, I had to track down the audio for that. But the, the beginning Klingit workbook is coming, the second edition anyways. Uh, this is what the cover is probably going to look like. Give you a sneak preview. Uh, I really like this photo right here. This was 2015 uh, in Yakdat. So they wanted to have a language conference there. Um, and at one point I walked in and someone was there who was a really cool person talking about how to teach a language and sharing with us this really impressive techniques of teaching a language. And there's one elder who's right here. Her name is Dastiya. Uh, there's actually two Dastiya, two people with the name Dastiya in that same room. This one was from Sitka. Her name is Ethel Makina. And I saw her and I was like, Wasayatiyata. 
how's this thing going? And she said, we've been sitting here for hours speaking English. We want to speak Tlingit. So I went to the presenter who they, they brought to Yakutat to share his knowledge. And he's, he's very nice. And um, I walked up to him and I said, hi. And I said, this is really cool. But the elders want to speak the language. So can we do something different? He says, absolutely. I'm just here to share some resources. It's your guys' thing. So we rearranged the room. Shenwa uh, Dakat, Nay Brown is in this photo as well. And she and I had been talking about some concepts that I think the same person had been sharing with us, which is the most important time is right now with endangered languages and getting people to high fluency as fast as you can and those who are at high fluency, getting them to spend a lot of time with elders. So we put all the elders in the, in the middle, all the speakers, and we had microphones, and we had them hand a microphone around, and they all shared their thoughts. And we tried to encourage people to sit really close to them. And then we just, they just shared their thoughts, and quite a few of them uh, are gone now. And so, like, I just think about that because there was like a lot of energy in the room. It was it was really incredible. It's pretty rare to get more than two or three speakers together these days. And so here we had probably 12 of them. And uh, it was really amazing the types of things that they shared. So I want to start going through this workbook uh, and just sort of telling you what's there and then also stopping now and then to oh, to have conversations about particular parts of it like the question part i think is pretty important um uh, nora dowenhauer uh, nora marks dowenhauer and richard dowenhauer they were such incredible pillars of Tlingit language scholarship and lots of other folks they uh, Nora, her parents, she worked with them a lot. Sekeke, Emma Marks, and Keith Yanai, uh, Willie Marks. They worked with lots and lots of people. Ida Kadishan, David Kadishan, Jesse Dalton. And, and it wasn't just here. There are all kinds of pockets of people doing amazing stuff with Tlingit speakers all over the place. But at some point, they, they sort of developed this methodology to teach Tlingit. And what the, what the methodology is, is basically starting with simple uh, nouns. So by simple, I mean it's easy for people who already speak English to say these. So you're not going to start with kukt. You're going to start with hit, and yana eight, and keys, and seek. And then you're going to work your way up to these other ones. So that was one of the engines of beginning Klingit is it gradually introduces the more challenging sounds. In the meantime, it's doing a whole bunch of question and answer drills and you start learning how to fill in the blank. And sometimes the blank is just this word and that word. Noun aya, this is that noun. Noun awe, that is that noun. And that's the sort of architecture of beginning Klingit. One of the things that I wanted to do was to try and lessen the reliance on English by using a bunch of pictures. So I just went and found a whole bunch of pictures for a whole bunch of these nouns. Then I wanted to go in and start sort of showing some of, a little bit more of the breakdown of how everything works. So when you use the beginning Klingit workbook, there's the big text stuff which you're learning, but then there's a whole bunch of stuff in little text which is sort of what Richard Downhauer used to call the more than you want to know section. It's like if you want to know it, it's there, but now we're going to sort of take a look at it as we go through there. So some of the things that it has is in every chapter there's like this really wonderful piece of language. This is from a much bigger speech and this was made into a song. And I think there's lots and lots of people who know the song, which is wonderful. But I want more and more people to know the context 
Like when you really examine that speech from Kitchnach, George Davis, a different George Davis than the one I worked with, um, it's actually pretty sad. But it's actually kind of happy because they were saying, we had kind of already given up hope. We thought it was just going to be gone, the language and the culture. But now we see what these young people are doing. And that's why we're going to open this thing up. So this, this line is Achawe Suhete Shagach Tutan. Hey, ya kuskate the kate. Hajik a nakhaskau de kate. Haka kuska hashifko hus. And that's the one that goes Suhete Shagach Tutan. Su he de sugar to tan ya ya kus ke da ke hajik a knock. I mess it up. As cow dick eat. Hey, hey. But then if you scroll down here, you'll see it's been kind of pulled apart a little bit. The, the idea here, and there's some revisions that are taking a long time because. This, these are three things, ga, u, and ka. And I think the way things are trending is at the beginning level, it doesn't really matter what they are. What matters is if you put those three things in a row and that part of the verb, that is how you build the future form of the verb, positive or negative. You've got to have those three things. They affect everything that's around it. So just sort of looking, and then we also take really close listens to these things that have been quoted elsewhere. We're like, oh yeah, there's a he. There's a he in there. We can hear it. So they're going through some revisions with that, with a lot of help from uh, Chashi, Will Geiger, and Yishkune um, Jeffleer. But so this breaks down sort of what this process is called is called segmenting and glossing. The segment means, let's break this so you can see every single individual piece of language in there. And we just say, this is the part that has meaning. Then underneath it is the gloss, and that's saying, this is what that thing means, right? And there's a bit of back and forth on when you do this. If you learn how to do this and you practice this, you'll probably develop your own preferences. Like, should you be saying focus, that, or that is? So it's, it's a little bit of a negotiation between languages. So the, one of the things with the Beginning Klingit Workbook, second edition, is there's this chapter that looks at the weather. And it says, here's the weather, here's how you say the weather is this way, the weather was this way, the weather is becoming this way, the weather will be this way. For those last three sections that start moving the verb around, those got moved to the end. So if you're learning what, let's just learn the weather right now. Because then we can learn some other stuff, and then we can get to the future, you know, the perfective, the future, and what's called the progressive imperfective. We're going to use terms for Tlingit in here, like perfective, future, progressive imperfective. It's important to sort of get familiar with these. Past tense, in the process of happening, future. Just because, and if you sort of, then they got all kinds of wild labels for some of them. Like one of them called like a potential attributive. It doesn't so much matter that you remember that. But it, what matters is the parts that are in there and what the meaning is. Okay. And we'll talk about all that stuff. We'll just keep sort of taking our walk through this beginning Clinkit workbook. But what these chapters are going to do is learn the sounds. So what we'll do in here is every now and then just say, hey, you know what? I'm having a hard time with this particular sound. And then we can take a look at it. So we're not going to really go through and drill all of the sounds. We might do it once, maybe twice. But then we'll just focus on ones that we might be having a hard time with right now. 
Then we get into some basics. What's this? What's that? The first chapter, then a set of nouns. But also this thing where we learn how to ask questions, these certain types of questions. What do you see? So this one uh, also includes uh, what do you have? So we start learning some pronouns. Me, you, them, my, your, there. Then we get our first verb. I see it, you see it, they see it. The next chapter moves into kind of being able to introduce yourself and learn about the clans. My name is, what's your name, this is my clan, what's your clan, where are you from, where are you born, who are your people, all that kind of stuff. And in this chapter, there's a list of all of the clans that I know of and how they're related to each other. The list is not intended to sort of correct anybody. It's just saying this is from looking at all the books that I've ever read and having all the conversations that I've ever had with people about this stuff. This is my best guess on how it all relates in terms of migrations, clans, and then the the way the clans became other clans. It's not saying any particular clan is better than any of them or anything like that. It's sensitive stuff, but I also think it's stuff that we're losing track of and we need to keep track of it. So when, if someone's duck oedi and someone's sog oedi, they need to know that they were the same people a long time ago. If someone's tukach oedi and someone's kach oedi, they need to know they are the same people a long time ago. Okay. Uh, then we get to the weather. And we learn how to say the weather is. We also get our first set of adverbs. Really, very. And then for some of them, not. We get into how do you feel? And we get into body parts. Starting to learn some body parts and start to learn how those work, and also say like, my elbow hurts, my knee hurts. Start getting, you know, north of 40, and then you, you gotta learn how to say all those things that hurt, right? Adu who is that? That chapter looks at kinship. So we're gonna take a look at that one as well, because there are some things that do get a little tricky. Niece, nephew, in-laws, you know, client opposites. Then we get into coming and going. Just some real basic forms. Going to the store, coming from the store, going home, coming from home. You're doing it, I'm doing it, they're doing it. The beginning thing at workbook really focuses a lot on one, two, three. One is you're talking about yourself. Two is you're talking about the person you're talking to. Three, you're talking to someone about someone else. Me, you, them. A lot of the stuff just cycles through those. At some point, we'll throw in a few more. Us, y'all, them all. Then at some point, we'll throw in people. There's a fourth person. Then we move into uh, what are they doing? Just a whole mess of verbs that we move through first person, second person, third person just so that you can see how it starts to work. I'm cutting it, you're cutting it, they're cutting it, I'm sweeping, you're sweeping, they're sweeping, I'm sewing, you're sewing, they're sewing. Pattern building and also starting to understand the verbs. And then what are we uh, eating? Starting to change the verbs a little bit, see what happens when we start moving them around. And then the last chapter is how is the weather going to be? The other thing that this workbook will introduce is there'll be some things to translate at the end of each chapter. You'll have 10 things that will go from Shinget to English, and then 10 things that will go from English to Shinget, fill in the blanks type of thing. So we'll look at it, and we'll see how we do. Uh, this is an updated map of 
the Thlingit dialects, and also there's a thing we call Kwan. Now one of the things I'm going to encourage you not to do, or I guess I'll discourage you from doing, is putting a, a plural S onto a Thlingit word. So for example, we shouldn't be the Shukach Adis, and you all shouldn't be the Kagwantans, or, or whatever the thing is, or Kwans. These are the Tlingit Kwans. So we're putting a, an English plural marker onto a Tlingit word. We're going to try not to do that. But the concept of a Kwan in Tlingit is the ancestral people of a place. So when we say Kunachu Kwan, Daislin Kwan, Shkut Kwan, those are very specific regions. It's like a state within the nation of the Tlingit. There are different dialects. I think there are four main dialects of Tlingit. Tanta. Nobody speaks it anymore. It is probably the original Tlingit language. Uh, Ichki, or Southern Tlingit, uh, a Degige in the middle, and Naki. So generally you have Northern Tlingit and Southern Tlingit. But then there's this thing that has a little bit of each. One of the main things that makes the dialects different is a vowel switch. So, for example, there's this phrase. Somebody tell me what this phrase means. Are you all, are you all ready? Right? If I am a northern Tlingit, I should say, Yun, ge, yi, wu, ne. If I am a southern Tlingit, or one of these kind of, a little of both, I would say, yun, ge, yi, wu, ni. Wu, ni instead of wu, ne. So one of the dialect switches goes from a to e. And not every time, but for quite a few things. Is it cake or is it keek? The other thing is for Southern Tlingit, there's this thing, when, when we learn about a verb, at the core of a verb, you have the stem and the prefix. The stem and the prefix. The prefix comes first, that usually says to whom it happens, who does it, all the conjugation business, and the classifier. Then the stem will have the verb root, which has meaning, like teen, but it's going to tell us whether it's teen, teen, or tin. Those are our three options. It's predictable. In the prefix, there's a bunch of things that will cause contraction with each other. If you've got uh, a plus y plus zero plus ya, you get awa. Okay? And, and we'll, you'll learn some of these things, like what happens when you change this? It goes to that. Change this, it goes to that. But they're mushing up with each other and causing that contraction. For Southern Tlingit, they are more likely to drop vowels. They just do it a little, it happens a little bit easier. There are maybe three or four speakers left of Southern Tlingit. Most of the speakers are in these two dialects right here. Now, the big thing with, with Tanta is it didn't have tone. Like we have high tone, low tone, they didn't have tone. They just had a different set of vowels. But there are some things that we do in Tlingit today that make sense if you look at how Tanta Tlingit works. The other big difference is between some of the inland communities, mostly Teslin and Carcross, and, and then the other communities. The big difference there 
is going to be a W sound that turns into an M. Sometimes it just does it, like spoo, spoom. Some of them you just have to remember. Oh yeah, that, that one is an M in Tussin. The other case is this perfective marker, but only if there's a vowel on before it and a consonant after it. Ow de gone. Um de gone. Ow de good. Um de good. Right, so the, the, but it's a rule. It's it's something we can learn and we can sort of figure out how to predict. A lot of thing I think is like learning how to predict it. But I think someone asked me, uh, what should I study? I'm studying thing, what should I do? I'm supposed to do like two to three hours every single day. So I think for me it's these kind of four categories. I like to think of it like these are the four house posts. Like you gotta build the house, you need the house posts. The first one for me is listening and speaking. Download some recordings. Just listen to them. Even if you don't know what's being said, it's just put yourself around it. You have to be around the language. If you want to learn like a language, you go to the place where they speak the language. But if nobody's speaking it right now, or very, very few, then you got to put it around yourself. However, we've got recordings, I'll show you where to get them, where we have the printed thing and the translation. You can listen to the talk uh, story by Shah Dog Robert Zubov. It's a masterpiece. It's a masterpiece. Then you can read along with it. And then you can just keep listening to it, and your brain already knows the translation. So you, you, your brain will do so much behind-the-scenes work. Oh yeah, I keep hearing this thing. That must be this kind of thing. The conscious and the subconscious. The other thing is speaking the language. Whether you just walk around. I would walk around all the time talking to myself. Yeah, I didn't, there's a lot of times I didn't have anyone else to talk to. I was studying in Minneapolis. Who am I going to talk to get with in Minneapolis? Okay. But then also like finding groups of people to try stuff. Challenge each other. Hey, let's write a little ten-sentence story every week. And maybe maybe it's got all kinds of errors in it. It, it doesn't really matter. The biggest thing is like, you say it, and we can understand what you're saying. Understanding is way more important than being correct. So that's the first pillar, I think. The second house post is finding out what these little bentwood boxes are and filling them full of stuff. I think it has nouns. That's the name of a thing. You learn a whole bunch of names for things. Like, what's this called? What's that called? What's this called? What, what kind of bird is that? What kind of animal is that? What's this thing? What do we call that? And you're just filling up your box. But then as you go forward, you'll realize there's a whole bunch of other boxes. There's these ones about around, under, over, through, those types of things. You gotta fill that box up with a bunch of stuff. Then there's going to be other ones, slowly, quickly, uh, carelessly, carefully, and you got to fill up. And so you'll, you'll start to realize what these things are and how they work. And you'll start to find ways to remember more and more and more of them. That's your vocabulary building. The third pillar is the structure of the language. You've got to sort of start getting... In, we pulled some stuff apart. We'll keep. We'll look at a bunch of pictures. We'll do a slow crawl through the Thinget workbook. But we'll also be talking about. Pay attention to this. We'll see this more. We'll see this more. Look for that. It's all over the place. But then start to grasp these things and also talk with your peers. When you're learning Thinget as a group, it's really important because when you go out there in the world, like. I could walk through, say, I could walk around all Juno and just listen to people. And I probably won't hear anybody talking about the Clinket classifier, classifier or like, you know, what is huh? somebody telling you know, we are the group that's having those conversations. And you and it helps us to understand it and it helps it be more real if we're talking about it with each other. Then the fourth part, I think, is a lot of self-care, self-monitoring 
recognize when your brain's getting tired of something, but also recognize when your brain's just sort of trying to be colonized, right? Because the English side of your brain, I think, will always be sort of saying, maybe let's not, because I just think there's these echoes of colonization that are there. You're not maybe consciously thinking, I don't want Tlingit, but that might be deeply seated into your subconscious. But you also got to sort of make sure that you're believing in yourself. Find these affirmations. There's a whole bunch of phrases that elders left with. You know, I, one of the things I really talk to speakers a lot about when I'm doing language documentation is I'll say, what do learners need to hear? It's hard. It's hard to do this stuff. What do they need to hear? And they give us really amazing words of encouragement. The other thing I would say to them is, tell me what you want your grandkids to know, and I will teach it to them. And that would, it would unlock something, and they would just start talking. Find those things, because there's a lot of self-doubt. There's a lot of, you're going to hit a bunch of walls. Sometimes when you're learning Tlingit, I say, it's kind of like you decided to climb this mountain. And it's so hard, and it takes so long, and you're at the top of the mountain, and you're about ready to celebrate, but then you look up and you realize that was just the hill in front of the mountain. You're like, oh, yeah, like we were in Glacier Bay one time at this immersion. Someone stood up and had this glass of water, and it was full. She was just saying, this is how I feel about my knowledge of Tlingit. I was like, yeah, that glass is full. She says, this is what I know. And then she pointed at the ocean out the window. She says, and that's Tlingit. And she started crying, and we all started crying. It's an uphill battle to be able to become something like the masters of old. But I think in order to get there, you have to just monitor yourself and monitor each other. Somebody, you know, it's all kinds of people who've stopped coming. It's all, you know, and I, I can't figure it all out, but there's hundreds and hundreds of people who've started to study Tlingit. And if they all took it to the end, we'd have hundreds of speakers right now. But we probably have 30 left, maybe. So those are kind of my thing. And then we can talk about it too. And um, what I'll share with you folks, um, maybe right now, is I'll just show you where to find some of this stuff. And, and dialects are important. So we're trying to document all the dialects. And, and you'll learn this set of Tlingit. But then if you say, OK, this is a different word where I come from, use that word. Instead. Okay. This so uh, this website, clinkitlanguage.com, links primarily to three to two places. One is a Google Drive where I try and keep everything that I have been able to collect that has to do with the Tlingit language. The second thing is a YouTube channel where I post these recordings of classes. Sometimes I'll make little videos, like the brains, no brains, that's on YouTube. Um, if I document speakers, I'll put that on YouTube. I haven't done that for a while because of COVID and travel restrictions. Uh, so, these, these are the things we're going to be using. Right? We went over this a little bit on Tuesday. But we'll, next week, we'll sort of take a look at each one of these things as well. How do you use these resources? And then uh, these are beginning resources. These are intermediate resources. These are advanced resources. We're going to take a look at all of these throughout this whole semester. And then sometimes you know, you're just drilling stuff. And you're like, OK, I got to. I want to focus on these birds. I'm going to learn a bunch of bird names. I'm going to learn all the bird names. When I see a bird, I'll know that bird. But then sometimes your brain gets tired. You're like, ah. So then just go look at some, read sample sentences out of the verb dictionary. Ask yourself how they're working. Identify the parts. Read one of the stories. Circle all of the verbs. If you can spot the verbs, 
underline all of the verb roots. This is stuff that you can start to sort of teach yourself how to do. So when you go down, uh, there's some additional stuff here. We'll take a look at all of this stuff. Uh, but here you'd see, this is where the course is going to, you'll see this video from tonight's class. We posted right here. So it'll say the date, the topic that the topics that we went over. We'll do feed, feeding fluffy sometime this semester. And then there's handouts. So the text from the chat, which I haven't been keeping an eye on. Oh, yeah. OK, I'll, I'll show you where that is. Uh, and any of the slideshows that we go over. So that uh, little readings and thing get, try not to read too far ahead, because we're going to go do a little bit of translation as we go. Uh, but any slideshows that we go over, I'll put them up there so you can have them. Have them, use them, teach them, change them, do, do whatever you want with them. If you go here to uh, resources and beginning materials, there's a bunch of other stuff here too. So the children of the Taku Society made these wonderful textbooks. They're making more. They're on here. Uh, if you scroll down, there's this place name. So this is not the entire place names book that the Alaska Heritage Institute put out. It's just the list of the names and the maps. But it's, it's a searchable document. Oh, Gunashish. Yeah. And um, so that if you say, oh, yeah, what is the name of, uh, what is it, Point Bishop or what, whatever they call it, right? So you could look up Bishop and, and you'll find it. You could do a text search in there. And then you'll see the Shinget name of it. If you go to resources and audio, and most of these, <laughs> some of them don't work. So let me know if you find one that doesn't work. I'll try and fix it. But you should be able to, like if we go down, you scroll down pretty far and you get to Hashuka, oops, our ancestors with a T. And if it works, when you push this little arrow, it should play. And if you push this downward arrow, you can download it. So these are MP3s. If you're looking for like the WAV files, I can get them to you. Uh, there's also a lot of other stuff that's recorded in Tlingit. If um, we have the entire Downhauer collection, if you're looking for something, uh, next week I'll show you how to how to access the Downhauer collection uh, notes. And then if you say, I want to listen to this one, it says tape 75. My grandma's on there. That's what I want to listen to. I'll put it up here. So usually what I'll do with those is they go down here and they'll just say tape 82 side A. It's probably all in Klingon, but maybe it's got sensitive stuff and it's not for everybody. But then we know what's on there as we talk to each other. And let's see. Yeah, so the text, so these ones when you go through, uh, some of them there'll be a, a little link underneath it. And that means here you can listen to it, here you can download it. And if I click this link, now I've got the text so I can read along. You want to get this uh, Raven Loses His Nose? It's a great story. Hilarious. This will be the last thing. I'm all right. So he tells this amazing story. That the context that I was told was they went to this museum where this hat was, this beautiful headdress of Raven Loses His Nose. They asked Don Awak, they had a whole group of elders there, he was one of them, if he would tell the story. They had um, Anna Katzik there, David Katzik's mother. She did a live translation of the story, which was really fun, especially if you really, if you really line it up too, because she's kind of telling her own amazing version of the story. Sometimes they're a little bit different, the way that they said those things. Then at the end, um, and he says some funny things through the story, right? There's just some funny things. In it. 
But then he's, he gets done and everybody claps. And then the clapping kind of dies down. And then you hear this elderly lady, I'm not sure who said it, but she said, a sunny flew away. That's your uncle's nose. And everybody laughs. It's really funny in Tlingit. There's like some things that are like really culturally funny in Tlingit. You can make fun of somebody's uncle a little bit, but it's also you gotta be careful, you gotta know what you're doing. And then they sang the song that goes along with this hat. Then you could download the audio, it's right there. Um, so yeah, next week we'll look at more of this stuff. Uh, and bring your questions if you got them. Your task for the weekend is to go through the dictionaries that you could find. If you can't find one, let me know. They're on our class website. There's a few different dictionaries on them. Under resources, beginning playing it, there's four different dictionaries you can access. I would like you to try and remember as many bird names as you can. Birds. Okay. And when we start class on Tuesday, we're just going to do this little game where we'll make a list of names. We'll go through in that. That's the order we go through. Our job is to say a bird that has not been said yet. It's hard to keep track of, but I'll try. And if, like, so someone says, uh, uh, and then three rounds later, if I hear someone say, I'll say, we already heard it. That means try again. At any point, you can say hooch. And that means I'm, it's all gone. And it's okay. There's, nobody wins a prize. Nobody loses anything. It's just for fun. And we'll see how many times we can go. And then uh, if some people fall out, it's totally fine. But then if you remember one, jump back in. And we'll just see how many we can name. It's kind of fun. Usually we end up naming quite a few. But I don't want to like hype us up too much because then we'll only do like 10 birds and I'll be sad. Okay, any questions? Y'all good? Mm -hmm. Are we supposed to be collecting stems or third person present or what form? Just the bird name. Just the name the of bird. the bird. I thought you said bird. I said verb, oh yeah. Birds, birdies, <laughs> little yes. Thank you for asking. <laughs> That's not a bird. <laughs> I'll say it's the mask and the hockey plexiglass that did it. Okay, gonna chase Johan. I'll see you folks on Tuesday. That, that story about Yeh. Could you show me where it is on the site again? I was yeah. looking at another part of the site where why you showed me. Did any of you guys want to exchange like contact info? Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Um and I'll send out an email to the group with a Google spreadsheet. I forgot to do that. We started doing that in advance Lingit. And then next week I'll show you all how to add yourselves or I'll send the link out through email to you. And add yourself to this program we're using called Basecamp, and we'll um, we'll look at if Jeremy's with us, he could probably talk to us about it too. But it's a way to stay in touch. With you. Okay, so would you recommend that over like texting or? Oh, however you guys. Okay. Want to do it. But yeah, however you want to do it for now, and then we'll switch. We'll transition over to the Basecamp because it. It has a calendar, and we can mm -hmm. use a message board, and we can chat with each other. Okay, cool. Bonus if we learn these bird names out Oh, yeah, yeah. If you bring a picture that's recent picture you could prove is from your phone, and then, yeah. or your camera. Uh, resources. Oh, it's right. Audio. Resources. Audio. Then just keep scrolling down. You gotta go pretty far. But then you start getting into ones with a blue link underneath. Got it. There's one that's like a uh, women's way or something like that that I've always wanted to listen to and it doesn't have fun now. Which one is it? Uh, can you scroll up towards the top? I think it was 
Like one of the ones like Ethel. Oh, okay. Like uh, this one here, maybe? I'll just text everyone. Oh, Ethel, see? Yeah, cool. Wow. If you find it, just send, send I'm going to go look tonight then. Yes. <laughs> Try and fix like. it. Okay. Uh. This summer, I was mashing around and excited a little bit. And we were quite a number of them further down that would play for me for whatever reason. Yeah, just if you could just send me the title, I can fix it. Cause I had a, I had it all on a different site, and I just uploaded them, and then when I moved, it didn't come with it. So what I need to do is transition them to the Google folder, and so I just haven't gotten to it. Yeah, run out of now in like a hundred steps. And uh, yeah, you guys could use any of the audio that's on there. That's great. I get it if you act it up. See you, Christine. Where in the interior are you are you coming from? Sheesh. Sheesh. Ah. Really getting over the border. Nothing. Sheesh. I'm uh, I might have. Uh, it's okay. I just needed a little.